So maybe what I'm going to do is start with uh, just allowing you to to set some boundaries and see how, where you want to see the meeting shape up, Cassandra, as we're doing this and maybe waiting for somebody else to make it make a request of what they were hoping to see from you. Today. Yeah, sometimes it takes a little bit to, to type in the chat window. <laughs> yes. So we have to, you know, pause a little bit. But usually the way I start any kind of talk, I try to, um, is to set up some ground rules, you know, some agreements that we have to make it a safe place for us to have dialogue. You know, recently in the news, there's been some thoughts shared. Um, Kanye West, Kyrie Irving, um, shared some thoughts um, that upset the Jewish community. Um, are you guys familiar with that? And yeah, um, and I was listening um, to oh gosh, John Stewart. I was listening to John Stewart, who was on Colbert show, and he was talking about the importance of what we're doing today, this dialogue that we're having, and that people shouldn't his his. Um, viewpoint, John Stewart's viewpoint. And I, I think I agree with them at this moment. You know, I agree with them. I could change my mind later, but I think penalizing people or trying to silence them because of a thought that they share is not the way to greater understanding. It's not the way to um, change a person's mind. Even. You know, and I feel like we don't have enough of these kind of dialogues um, so that we can, doesn't mean we change our mind, but so that we have at least an understanding of another person's point of view and where that thought or, uh, you know, where they arrived at it, we can understand that better. I think it makes us a better world. So I like to start, can you guys see my slides? Yeah. Yeah, I usually start with setting up some rules of engagement. Five simple things that I just introduce is, you know, listen to understand, because I think Sometimes when we're listening, we're either waiting for our turn to talk or we're listening to argue. And so today, just, just to set this as a constructive space, I want you guys to agree to we would listen to understand, right, and, instead of argue. The other is kind of that Vegas rule that they say, you know, um, what happens in Vegas, you guys know it, stays in Vegas. Stays in except Vegas? Yeah, what happens in Vegas usually shows up on Instagram and Twitter, you know, but in this circle that we're forming today, let's just agree that what happens here, what's said here stays here, um, and it connects to the next one, which is respect others' experiences. I may not even understand your experience if I haven't had that experience and if my experience has been different. But I could respect another person's experience. And I think that goes with that what happens here stays here. Because if you take conversations or experiences that I share with you today outside of this circle, it's disrespectful. And what people don't have who are not here today is they don't have context. And so if we respect each other's experiences, even if they're different from our home, listen to understand and remember the Vegas rule. You know. I like to have a dialogue. I don't want to be the only one talking. Um, so, but I respect people who, if they're not ready to share, don't want to share, you have the right to pass, right? But I encourage everybody to participate 100%. You know, it's kind of like pass if you, if you want to, right? That's your right. Um, but try to lean in because I think you get more out of every conversation when you lean into the sometimes discomfort, right? Like D, E, and I is not a comfortable conversation. Um, and to, to grow, growth is not comfortable, right? But, I, but you get more out of it when you participate 100%. So those are the five kind of rules of engagement. If, if you have another one to add, would you put it in the chat window? Like what would make you feel safe talking about what sometimes is a, um, divisive conversation and uncomfortable conversation. What would make you feel safe? If you had anything to add, would you please drop that in the chat window? I see that a couple of people said that they either saw it or that they agree with the fact that people have the right to have a different opinion. And uh, what I love about 
conversations I've had with you or in groups with you and other people is that being respectful of somebody's different opinion frequently meant we were asking questions of each other and sharing what our experience had been and how that shaped where we were standing within our perspective. It in no way was pushing against somebody to say, you must agree with me. However, what it did was allow them to see what had shaped your opinion so that you could have a better understanding of commonalities that you have and differences that you still hold true. And I think sometimes it's finding those commonalities that allow us to step forward and develop the things that allow that diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging to be built. Yeah. Hey, Luz, do you see anything in the chat window? Like, yes. has anyone added yes. a um, ground rule or have a comment that that you want to share? Yes. Would you like to share? I, I believe the name is pronounced Altair. I, I'm sort of losing my voice, so hopefully you can hear me. Okay. Um, so my, my comment was to um, be given the chance to explain an opinion before an outright judgment is made is a, a safe way of setting ground rules and, and I think opening up dialogue. Thank that's, you, Altair. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And then we have another one from Gail. Gail, would you like to share your comment? Sorry, I'm sure I was trying to scarf down lunch too, so I apologize. Um, <laughs> I was just saying, and it really pairs nicely to Altair's comment um, around just carrying the posture of curiosity over judgment and that, you know, respect comes from even not even if you understand or don't understand, agree or not agree, but just holding respect and curiosity over judgment would be one I would like to add. I love that. And I love the curiosity too, right? Like, I think, you know, I try to, hey, hey. I am, I am prejudiced. And the truth is we all are. And it's a, it's a strong word. And, and I don't think we like to be associated with it, but we all have biases. We all prejudge people and prejudge situations. And so to be reminded to understand and listen to someone's opinion before making a judgment is so important, um, not easy, <laughs> so important. And then that curiosity to just have that curious mindset um, opens up our perspective. I think we don't have enough of that curiosity over judgment. Yeah. And then uh, we have two more. And for sake of time, I'll just read through them. Ground rule Com- comments are not personally directed to you. Don't take it personal personally. And then Jennifer said, assume positive intent. Yeah. Yeah. So So as you look at what's on the screen, right, those rules of engagement and the others that people have voiced and added to our chat, if you can agree to abiding the rest of the time we have together by those ground rules, um, would you type a Y for yes in the chat window or an N for no in the chat window? Lots of yeses coming in. So, Cassandra, so, let's move forward. Yeah. So, what I what I'd like to do is to look at um, the agreement that we have in the chat window. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm seeing the whys and the yeses. I'm not seeing those. And I just want to point out. Um, that that's a pretty amazing thing that we just accomplished together, that we have 100%, as far as I'm seeing, agreement. And if you think about the society in which we live right now, there is, it is rare to get 100% agreement. And so pat yourself on the back, right? Applaud yourself for that agreement. And yes, absolutely, I think we can move safely forward. So. What I would love for you to do is, 
is talk a little bit about the purpose and passion behind your work with DEI and where that comes from for you. You just muted yourself too. Yeah, there we go. I'm unmuting. <laughs> it's been a few years. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, that's a good question, Susan. The purpose and passion of where this work came from. I think that I've always been um, an advocate of fairness. And I can't tell you where that exactly came from. Maybe I was just born with it um, because I would find myself fighting other people's battles often. Even if their their um, slight or disadvantage didn't personally affect me, and in fact, someone told me, Cassandra, you can't fight every battle, <laughs> and you've got to choose your battles. And I'm like, but it's not right, you know. Like, and so that is a that is something that 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 lives with me, you know. Uh, that um, need for fairness, for inclusion for acceptance, you know, and, and, and maybe it's an early wounding of my own. I remember um, in the eighth grade, I tried out for cheerleader. I remember working really hard to be very good at cheering. Um, and there weren't a lot of people that looked like me on the squad. In fact, there were no people of color on the squad. In the football field, there were a lot of people of color. Um, and only recently can football players get endorsements and get paid, right? All that money was going to the school. Um, but in the eighth grade, I tried out. I did really well, but I didn't get selected. And um, they selected 12 white cheerleaders. Right. And the parents of the black football players were in an uproar. And they went to the school and said, this is not fair. Why don't we have representation on our squad? We have talented individuals that should be qualified for the squad. So long story short, I was added to the squad. But to add me, they had to add two more because there was I was 14th. I was 14th place. So they added me and another person. You know, mixed emotions about that because I want to earn I want to have merit. I want to know that I belong because I earned it, that, I, that I'm not a token, you know, that, that I have something. And so I made the squad every year after that because I worked really hard. But in the back of my mind, I always wondered if I was just this token place on the squad. In the squad, I had to learn and assimilate a lot about everyone else on the squad. They had to learn very little about me. Because when you are the dominant culture in a team, in the workplace, you don't have to learn or assimilate. Those that are in the minority groups, uh, the underrepresented groups, have to learn the lay of the land and assimilate. And that's not easy <laughs> because you have to almost like disown a part of who you are and show up as close to the dominant culture as possible to be accepted. So I would say that is an early experience that also drives this work yeah. that I do. And I see. One of, yeah, I was going to say one of the things you and I have talked about is the the difference between the ideal of what we're all reaching for and the reality in the workplace, and how you hold space between what is currently happening there and how we build towards that long term goal. So one of the things that has been talked about is that in those kind cultures where we're trying to really be respectful of the differences that we all have, how we still need to create a, an awareness for the current perspectives that we're seeing and how some people really aren't aware of what that is and how they are showing up in that. So uh, how do you see uh, building trust in those environments to create that connection between people happening? Um, so you said a, you said a lot there. So I'm going to go back to what I what I captured first was about this ideal state, and was the other ideal versus the reality of the moment. Yeah, yeah. So I I think I hold this ideal state in my body. I do. Like I want it to. Like I'm a kumbaya 
<laughs> you know, that's where I wanted to be, but that is not where we are. Um, I just came back from SHRM's uh, inclusion conference in San Diego a couple of weeks ago, and we're all trying to figure this out. Like there's no, like, there are people doing some good things and some good work out there, but we are not at the finish line. And what I try to tell people is this a journey. Like um, we got here by years <laughs> of a system that is advantages some and disadvantages others. And that, that is not a system that's going to be dismantled quickly. Right. Um, yeah. And so for me, because I hold this ideal state in my body, I have to regulate my patience. Like last night, I was just saying to myself, people are doing the best that they can. But like, I have to remind myself because I can get frustrated at the pace of change and progress. And it's a journey. And I don't think it's a, it's a destination place that we're going to arrive in this diverse, equitable, inclusive environment right and we've arrived it's work to maintain that right so it's it's a forever evolving and continuous journey towards us being better people I listened to a podcast with Brene Brown and I think the author was Channing and she said anti-racism and I would substitute that to say DEI is about good people becoming better people and I think that's the journey we're on it's about us as good people, kind people, um, inclusive people, trying to be better people and looking around and saying, who's not included and how can we include them? Like, how can I be better? What can I learn so I can be more inclusive? That's the journey. And, and I think trust is a big factor in how we do that because you have to feel trusting that others are going to respect who you are whether it is a physical disability, a disability of gender, or how you want to show up as an individual, all of those things come in in different respectful ways in various groups. Some parts of them are accepted very easily, and some others seem to make people uncomfortable. One of the things I have loved about my experience with you is that you have been a leader who is leading even when you are not necessarily in a position of DEI leadership in an organization. But as an individual entrepreneur, you were creating events or leveraging other people's events to create diverse conversations about things. Um, I can think of a character day, a 50-50 day, real dialogue meetings that you set up with just individuals that allowed people to come together. Can you kind of talk about how that led you from being an entrepreneurial solopreneur to actually working inside corporations? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, well, yeah, let me see. I love those events, by the way. Those were spectacular. We had 100, 100 people or so and 50 talking about gender equality or um, character, you know, and leadership and how to build character in the next generation, all from different political persuasions, you know, all this diversity uh, in a room, but we were able to create a space where we could constructively have dialogue. And I think that's what's missing, you know, like, I think that's why what John Stewart said on the Colbert show resonated with me, because I think we don't do enough of this, this dialogue, and sharing different perspectives and expanding our own. Um, I like that I like to be challenged in that way, it doesn't always feel good. Uh, but I do like I do appreciate it. Um, I think we, you know, it's not that we watch different news, we do. And today the news is really polarizing how it's reported. But I think the problem isn't that we watch different news, it's that we don't talk to each other. And, and I think coming from an L&D leadership development background, I was facilitating conversations in my class. Like I didn't feel like I was the expert at the front of the room. I had some expertise, but I also recognized that the adult sitting in the audience had expertise too. So my introverted self to get energy in the class, I would facilitate conversations around the topic. So 
it's pretty natural for me to do that because I feel like it's pretty boring if I'm the only one talking, <laughs> you know. But having that those perspectives shared and opening up to different perspectives and allowing it to stretch your own because I think DEI is a growth mindset. And I don't know how you grow without your thoughts being challenged. Like, how do you do that? <laughs> if I'm only talking to people who agree with me and think yeah. the way that I think, that I think that's a pretty narrow perspective. And I think if we're trying to create inclusive spaces, I think we, we have to be challenged by other people's perspective and experience it, you know, and allow it to widen our own, whether we change our mind or not. Bambo has raised hand. Uh, you want to come forward with whatever question or statement you want to make? Thank you for stepping forward. Sure. Can you hear me okay? C can you hear me? Yes, we could hear you. Okay, perfect. So my question is, and actually I'll come on video for the question so it makes it easier to see me. Um, how do you... I'm going to put it in, in, in vernacular. How do you deal with crazy? <laughs> you know, we just came through the midterms where, you know, the Republicans didn't do as well as they wanted to because some of their candidates just were just far out there. And it wasn't that people thought that, you know, everything was good, great, but they just were not willing to adopt crazy and like, you know, put way out. And I think with DEIA and topics of this nature, there's an implicit assumption when you have the conversation that that you're talking to with somebody who has a certain baseline in terms of just their ability to accept different arguments or the ability to accept certain basic things. But that's not always true. Sometimes you deal with, you may be engaged with somebody who really has you know, out of really far extreme views on, on, you know, issues that are DIA related. And when that's the case, when you don't start from any kind of commonplace, how do you kind of get that conversation going uh, and provide any kind of legitimacy to views that really may be extremely uh, far, far out? Cassandra, can you step up for that one? And Talk about how you have, in various situations, engaged someone who, as Dia said, is so far opposite of us that we wonder if there's any commonality at all or openness yeah. to even listen. Yeah, I have some thoughts on it. I was uh, in the chat. If you guys have thoughts, too, I'd love to hear them. But, you know, um, got a couple things go through my mind. First of all, we're all crazy. <laughs> crazy is in the eye of the beholder right like 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 bamboo i love the question because i have this this i had this conversation last night with someone and we were talking about politics um but to the other they think we're crazy right so they're asking the same question about us like i don't understand how they can think we're crazy because it feels like we're you know but they're asking the same questions. How do you how do you deal with crazy? The other thing is I will talk to anyone who can we can set some ground rules for safe space and have a dialogue. Everybody's not ready for that kind of dialogue, right? In my classroom, I often ask people to show of hands who's here as a vacationer. You came to class because you wanted a vacation from the work, right? Because we know they show up. Who's here because they're a true learner. They're here and open. They have a growth mindset. They want to learn. And who's here because they're a prisoner? They were voluntold to be here. And very quickly, I said, if you're a prisoner, the door is open. Like, if you're a prisoner, you're probably not set up to have a dialogue. So like knowing who, I, I mean, if I say I won't talk to crazy or I won't talk to people who don't agree, or see it the way I see it. Um, I don't know if that's a growth mindset, but I won't talk and engage with people who are not safe to engage with. I won't do that because it's just not productive, right? But I, I do think that we're gonna have to lean into the discomfort of hearing a different perspective 
other than ourselves and remembering, I think there was a ground rule that don't take it personal. Yeah, I'm sharing my thought. I'm sharing my idea. Don't take it personal. Let's not fight. Let's listen to understand. May not change my mind. Like that's not comfortable. I try to watch the other news network. I try just so I can hear how news is being reported. <laughs> it is so hard. I may, I think my top is two minutes. After two minutes, I gotta go, right? But I'm trying to hear it from a different perspective. I'm trying to challenge my own thought. You know, a lot of what I hold came from my parents and they that came from their parents. I wanna challenge them and say, is that true today? Is that really how I believe today? I need that challenge. Does that help bamboo? Bambo? Yes, thank you very much. And Bambo's correct, yes. <laughs> Bambo? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for that. And, and what I love about what you were saying, it's holding space for them to still have their perspective, despite how radically different it is from your own. And honoring the fact that they come to it as quote unquote honestly as they possibly can with the experience they have had. And that creates that dichotomy that we need to create the, the space for us to find any commonality. Is the sky blue? Is the flower beautiful? Whatever it is that allows a discussion about something aside from the point of difference to create the common space to start from. And sometimes those are pretty small, very small spaces. But it's amazing how a slight crack in that can start to allow people to hear when you understand it from their value point. And that becomes great. Daniel, oh I gosh. see you raising your hand. And, and Cassandra, you may not know this, but many of us do. Daniel is blind. So we have a different diversity in our group even today. Come on out, Daniel. Well, thank you. And, you know, I was going to say, I've spent all of my adult life, you know, advocating on blindness and disability issues. And a few months ago, it occurred to me that the <clears throat> disconnect be between what I assumed the, the sighted or non-disabled world knew about my reality and what people actually know was far broader than I than I ever anticipated. So for instance, I, I have always understood that if you were to break down the barriers that I face that are intrinsic to lack of eyesight versus those that are structural or societal in nature, I would say that that's probably 20% intrinsic and 80% everything else but your average person would probably have those numbers inverted. And so I'm really taking a step back and saying, okay, what other things have I taken for granted that I need to go back and really start talking with people about because I can't address misconceptions I don't know about. So yeah. my question for Cassandra was, you know, kind of going back on that, um, how do we, how do we, um, dig for those misconceptions in a way that helps people, you know, helps people get to where they are able to share some of those deep uh, biases or misconceptions that we, so that we can finally address them. Sometimes that we're not even aware of them even having, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking about like that. Can you repeat that for me, Daniel? Because, yeah, can you just repeat that question for me again? Yeah, so, you know, we, we are aware that someone who lives life differently than we do, that they're going to have misconceptions. And we try to gauge what those misconceptions might be. But how do we, how do we, yeah. how do we, um, dig for how do we get the next level of, understa of understanding of those misconceptions more effectively how do we how do we find out what's really at the base of people's uh, misconceptions yeah 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 you know what and the, the thing that's coming up for me is we do we do what we're doing now like we have a conversation like um 
Dana, we have it at Hallmark where I work, we have a um, employee resource group around disability, disability inclusion group. And they had a um, how to talk about disability kind of um, event. And it was, it was a great event. There were like over two or 300 people on that virtual call. And we were talking about, like, we don't want, like to call people disabled. Like I said that, like, I don't want to call people disabled. Like, I don't like that label. I don't like that word. And then someone who um, has a prosthetic limb said, but I am, but I am disabled. Like I'm, and she's okay. Like she owns that word. And so it was helpful for me just to have that dialogue and to talk about, you know, my uneasiness, but to hear how she owns it. Like that kind of dialogue helps us to uncover and make choices about what we choose to believe and how we choose to behave going forward. And if we can't, you know, we have to create safe space for that. Disability is one of those difficult topics. And I think we don't, we don't lean into that difficult, that discomfort enough to, to understand the experience of the other. There was a cartoon that I shared. Um, we were talking about neurodiversity in one of our other um, DNI councils. And um, it was a cartoon of some kids waiting to go into a school building and it had snowed. And so the, the adult was shoveling the snow off the steps so that this group of kids could get into the school. And there was a person in the wheelchair um, asking the person to shovel a ramp so that they could get in. And the person responded, as soon as I shovel the steps for this group, this large group of people, then I'll shovel the ramp. And the person in the wheelchair responded, but if you shovel the ramp, we could all get in. And I think, I think that we don't have enough conversations to get to the fact that by making the workplace inclusive for the marginalized, we make it inclusive for everyone. Like I think people, especially people who have hold, hold places of privilege, sometimes may feel like Creating access for one group is a reverse <laughs> discrimination for me. And they don't see the connection of how, and now actually it improves it for everyone, you know? And I, I don't think we get to that understanding unless we have a conversation. And Dana, I probably went around the, the path, so <laughs> I'll stop sharing. No, thank you for that. And, and I think, you know, I've heard of places where they have like people eat blindfolded or a restaurant where it's dark and the lights aren't on. So people understand what the blind face in every meal, in every experience that we aren't at. And Daniel and I have been together at events where a group of us are together. He's part of us. And yet there are moments I can look around the group and what is happening is completely oblivious to the fact that since he can't see what's going on, he can only take in what he hears and feels and that we have to help share with him what is maybe happening at the other end of the table so that he knows he's still included in it. How do yeah. we do that in a, in a larger event? How do we help somebody and, and I think that's where we have to ask the questions and allow them to speak up in ways that we frequently don't even stop to think about. So Daniel, I really appreciate you asking about that today. Thank you. Also, I would like to share real quick, Cassandra, you hit a nerve with uh -oh. that example in a good way, <laughs> in a good way with that ramp story, because like where my mind was going, it's like, okay, a ramp, one person. And then you said the perspective of the person in the wheelchair saying, yeah, but if you clear the ramp, everyone can use it. And like, poof, my mind just opened up having not thought of that as a, solu a solution, but you're right. You know, when I see an elevator at, I'm in New York, Miami, um, but in New York, there's no elevators for the mass transit 
uh, for individuals. There's only certain perspective points where there's a, an elevator or even an Uber, if you're in a wheelchair or uh, a disabled in a different way. There's so many different ways that we have to see how to gain more access for individuals. Yeah. And we have a good point. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Well, to your point, Luz, I mean, to have this happen, it's because of this, right? Like, it's because of these dialogues. And I think that's the, the importance of it. Um, yeah, I put in the groups that we need diverse representation in our groups. In the decision-making bodies, we need people like Daniel. We need people that look like me. We need people that have different experiences, different perspectives, because they'll see things that we won't see. Exactly. Like I, you, you see what I'm saying? And that's, that's the benefit of having diverse teams, of having diverse groups, um, because- And not hiding, things. right? Not yeah. having to hide who you are. Like you said, to your point, you had to assimilate to the majority instead of them wanting to know anything about you, which I'm going to link to the question or comment by Sarah Jones. Mm -hmm. She wrote, uh, or Sarah, would you, would you like to share? Um, it's a little noisy where I am with some guitar riffs happening. What am I doing? What is this asking me about? Sorry, can y'all hear me? Yeah, we'll yeah. hear you. So apologies for the guitar riffs in the next room. But um, no, I just, bo both of my children are on the spectrum for autism, like mild and I have, I have a nine-year-old and a three, almost four-year-old. But, but what I was sharing is when you were talking about being called different I think you use the word disabled and how they kind of owned it it's I go back they're mild and high functioning you would just by looking at them wouldn't know anything and that, so that's the thing is you wouldn't know anything but they do have there are certain things and, and even I had a relative uh, my mom stayed with us over the summer and after that I realized how much I manage my children, like how much I've just all the techniques and learnings to help like to keep them on their schedule and the different things that do make it a little bit, you know, like what you said, the kind of the neuro atypical. But so when they're in a new environment with a new caregiver, it's one of those like, you know, again, like an hour playing like at church or something like that. It's like, okay, do I bring it up? Do I mention it? Do I point out their difference or wait and see how it goes, wait and see on if they're like, oh, they did the, you know, it's, Whereas, and I've definitely had better experience when, if when I'm up front and mention it, then they're like, oh yeah, they did, you know, they, they're on their team. It gets them on their team. And even from initial diagnosis of my son, that was the biggest thing is turning from he did this, he did this, he did this to like, oh, he did so great. Just getting them on, on your side instead of telling you everything that's not typical about how they behaved. And, you know, so it's both, but again, I, I understand. It's, anyway, so it was interesting to hear that perspective of, but I am, because like I said, it's like, but they are, they have differences that again, aren't, you know, we, they're in all their speech therapies and all the different things they are going to have a great life. It's going to be fine. You know, again, you know, it's again, mild compared to some, but again, it, it does make a difference in a lot of situations that you forget about until it's like, Oh yeah, I should have, I should have mentioned that. I don't think because yeah. you know, to me, it's normal to me. It's, it's our everyday life. It's always, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So it did kind of like you said, it kind of hit a nerve a little bit of like, I, and I don't think of it as part of diversity. But when you're talking about that, it's like, it's something that we deal with because it's, yeah. they are not typical with their peers in a lot of situations. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, that's why I say it's a journey, right? Yeah. There, there's no destination to creating this inclusive space, inclusive workplace, inclusive world. Uh, we continue to learn and share the, the, the topic of neurodiversity that the Unite, our IT DNI Council presented um, a couple of weeks ago or, or a month ago. There was such good sharing and people like, you know, when you can't see your disability, you can hide it. And then you don't risk being taken, you know, being judged or being left out. And so people hide it. But we had three brave, courageous folks to share how, you know, their autism or uh, ADHD, how it shows up in the workplace and how we can create a more inclusive workplace um, for them to thrive. Um, and a lot of the things that would do would help all of us. But even at the end of that great conversation, someone at the end said, well, how much accommodation do we need to make? And like, that was the tone of the question. And, and I didn't respond immediately. Someone else said, 
there's a good learning module. There's a good learning module out there on that you might want to look at. And I thought that's a perfect example, bamboo. Like some people need to get more learning before they can engage in a conversation that's constructive. Um, Because if, and that's such a typical, you know, someone that's typical, right? Like uh, that's privileged to say, how much accommodation do we need to make? Because they're not walking a mile in someone else's shoes, right? I mean, it's a growth mindset, it's empathy, it's compassion. It's all of the things that make us good humans. That's why I think DEI is about us good people becoming even better people. And we have a little under um, 15 minutes, but we had two hands up. Daniel had a question and Alper, I think you had a question as well. Daniel, would you like to go first? Sure. I will just um, kind of tie this up really quickly if I can. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, I wanted to explain just quickly. I, I use the term disability and I, I try to own it going back to that point because as I mentioned earlier, in my mind, a, a small percentage of the issues that I face in my daily life are intrinsic to my body as opposed to the structural or societal things out there. The things that people assume those of us that are blind can't, you know, can't do and base their judgments off those assumptions rather than asking. The preference for print over braille or for using certain kinds of electronic formats that are not screen reader friendly. Those are design choices. And so, you know, Cassandra, going back to your point earlier, there is a bit of assimilation that occurs on our end, too, and accommodation is based off of that assimilation model. It's, okay, you have failed to assimilate, you failed to access the materials that we want you to be able to access in our way, you have failed to meet our expectation of what capable looks like, therefore, how much do we have to bend versus the experience you so eloquently shared earlier about the ramp and what we call universal design, where it's like, hey, there's no assimilation here. There's no accommodation here. There's a way for everyone to get to the same place in the same way without any preference or privilege. And so to me, that's why the word disability is something I own because it shines a light on those um, d discrepancies. I like that. Thanks for sharing. So just, I just had a kind of a comment on what Sarah and Cassandra said related to neurodiversity and the workplace. And I think it's, it's really, um, as a, I'm, I'm a parent of some, of a child with lots of food allergies. So I get the, the, um, kind of the ease there is in being a caregiver of a child and you can advocate, you know, how to advocate, you know, when to advocate and so forth and what, how much information is appropriate. And I see the challenge, I think, of in the workplace, if you're someone uh, with neurodiversity, how much do you want to share with your team? And I have seen people just kind of blatantly um, decide that, you know, some person is there they're not a team player or they're, you know, they're difficult to work with. And like on the back end, I, you know, I happen to know like, oh, this person all has these things that they deal with every day. It's not shared to the public group. It's not for me to share, but I'm, I think I'm more consciously thinking about now how, how do I help create an environment where I'm not disclosing personal information to people, but like getting people to think like, no, they're not difficult. It's just the way they approach the situation. And if we can, you know, because I think when you label people, especially at work, like this person's difficult or whatever, like that sets a trajectory for them on their job. And so um, that's just something I just, because you guys both touched on it, I just wanted to share, like it's something I'm consciously kind of thinking of more now that that's really kind of a hidden thing. And in the workplace, it can be difficult, I think, to share, you know, sometimes people don't want to share, right? Like they just, I want to hear, do, do my job and I don't want to let this thing define me. So, yeah, no, I mean, that's so real. We were doing a series on a quarterly series on code switching, you know, and helping people understand uh, the LGBT experience and why some people don't bring their whole selves to work because it can be harmful, right? Or, or the, um, uh, ethnic uh, differences, Black people and the code switching that goes on to be accepted, 
when we got to disability and no one wanted to participate. <laughs> They're like, no, I don't want to out myself, right? Because I don't know how people are going to respond to that. And so, um, yeah. And how we can we be allies to people in the workplace to create more inclusion? Like, and I think what is asking questions because people are going to argue with you if you tell them what to do. But if we can form some questions like, you know, what's a different way of seeing that rather than labeling the person difficult? You know, like just, I don't know what the question is, but like asking those what, how, you know, types of questions, not the why, because that's an argument, but, you know, asking questions to get people to start to think in different ways. I love that perspective, Cassandra, because that could be very helpful in one of those situations where you know something about someone, but other people might not. Um, so with that being said, there's three people who have their hands raised. Uh, Lion Shell, she has her hand raised first, and then we have Jennifer, and then Susan has a question. Hi. So, you know, Cassandra, you went right into where I was going because I was going to talk about assimilating and code switching. Um, and I really feel that um, it's, it's really like a representation thing. I feel like we just need more advocates, more people who really stand out and shine and represent their groups as much as they can um, so that other people can come into that. You know, I'm sure you may have heard that um, story about like there's all these monkeys in the cage and like they're teaching them this behaviors and everyone keeps coming in. And then you have a whole group of monkeys that are new and they don't understand why it's happening, but they're still partaking in the way that things were taught to them. And the story is better than that, but I wanted to summarize it because I know we have a time thing. But um, essentially, I feel like that's kind of what happens in corporate America because when or in a lot of different settings, because when you come in and you see other people who do look like you or you look for the representation um, of people that may be similar to you and they've assimilated really perfectly, sometimes what they'll do is they'll teach you to assimilate as well. And sometimes they'll say, hey, girl, I just wanted to let you know, you might not want to wear your hair that color, or you may not want to say this in the meeting because, you know, this person is going to say that. And it kind of teaches us to code switch and it kind of teaches us what's acceptable in our workspaces. So by being able to be unapologetic and come on and really show who we are and be a strong representation, we open the door up for other people to come in as well and also bring their true selves because that's the culture we created. Because I feel sometimes um, when the culture is like really, really toxic, it's kind of hard to have those conversations because everyone's so afraid and they're trying to cover themselves and protect themselves and they don't want to stand out in a way that's going to be detrimental to them. But by creating a culture where, okay, this is how we are. It's not about, you know, how it was in the past, but like right now, this is how we are. Then we can continue to, we can continue to bring in new talent and bring in new people um, who can come in and be what we're already trying to emulate, you know, instead of having to do the rework of washing everything, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, like I put a, a series of chat uh, comments in the chat, like we don't get the benefits of diversity and inclusion, because there are benefits when we create diverse and inclusive spaces. But when people are assimilating to the dominant culture or code switching, or fitting into the culture, right, which is how things get done around there, yeah, we don't get the benefits. It's only when we open up and allow people to bring their cool selves to work. Um, do they are they able to contribute the the strengths that they bring to the table. And we have room for one more question. Jennifer, you wanted to share something? Uh, I did, thank you. I think that the discussion on culture really hits the nail on the head. People are not gonna share if there's no psychological safety and you have to create that culture and it takes work and it takes consistency. And um, for some people in this group, they, they may have heard a comment on another uh, webinar that I've been on, but I, I know you can't tell by looking at me, but I have a learning disability. I have a traumatic brain injury. Um, and so I sometimes need accommodations for things and people just look at me like I'm nuts. I have to be, you know, before the company I'm working in now, I had to be very selective when I asked for those accommodations. Um, I'm also Jewish and have been at companies where they did invocations to Jesus Christ. And when I would ask for us to be a little more denominational, non-denominational, 
I was told, well, this is a Christian company in a Christian country. And if you don't like it, don't work here. So I left. Um, so it's, it, it's about differences we can see and differences we can't see. But the point is, you, and I, I even put in the, in the chat, one of my, a good friend once told me, you know, don't judge my breakthrough till you know what I've been through. And I just thought that, oh, was, okay. that was very appropriate. Yeah. Man, you know what, Susan, this conversation could go on and on. I have to come back and join you guys. You know, we see the world the way we are. We see the world the way we are. When we look into the world, we see it the way we are. We often judge the world the way we are, too. And this conversation is about going off of autopilot and opening up our perspectives to see the other's experience, to try to understand the other to create inclusive space for the other, not being afraid of the other, and and also being willing to make mistakes because that's how we learn. Like we're afraid to make a mistake, we won't say anything, we won't speak up, and we won't learn and we won't grow. Right. And I really wanna thank you, Cassandra, for how you have opened up this discussion. I love the fact that we have had many of our attendees participating openly, sharing their experience how different and unique it is for each one of them and how the entire group here has been supportive of each other in this discussion. Uh, I just love, love, love the fact that this is a place that has been safe and possible for us to be ourselves without judgment. Uh, We have just a minute or two. Is there something you would like to say in conclusion, Cassandra? Uh, I think we're demonstrating (laughs) We're just demonstrating the the environment, the spaces that we want to live, work, you know, and thrive in. We're doing that. And if it's possible here, I think it's possible in other places, but it takes courage, right, to disrupt the systems that are keeping it the way that it is, right? It takes courage. And to Jennifer's point, not all spaces want to be inclusive. And that's when you find another job, right, Jennifer? You know, yeah. Oh, okay. I heard I, I heard stop, and I was like, I gotta stop. Uh, I'm a disruptor, and you know, and I want to see growth, and I want to see progress, and it may not be as fast as I as I want to see it. So I regulate my own patience. But if the space isn't moving, then I have no purpose there. I just have no purpose and I have to go to another space. 